Crock sold paper cups for 16 years. His commissions provided a nice lifestyle for his wife Ethel and their daughter Marilyn, who was born in 1924. But the money came at the expense of his relationship with his family. Work was everything to Ray. He spent countless hours with his customers, learning everything he could about what worked and what didn't work in the food industry. I made up my mind that if I ever got into the food business, I would do what this one was doing or what that one was doing, and I wouldn't do what that other one was doing, and I got so that I could assess uh, values. In 1939, Croc saw value in a new device one of his customers had built, a five-spindled milkshake machine called the Multi-Mixer. Croc knew immediately that a machine capable of making five milkshakes at a time was a big improvement over the single-spindled machines that most soda fountains were using. At 37, Croc left a successful career in the paper cup business and became the Multi-Mixer's exclusive distributor. Bray made a lot of money selling Multi-Mixers. I think uh, in the late 40s or around 1950, he was making about $25,000 a year, which was a lot of money in those days. But as Ray approached his 50th birthday, his business began to slow down. By the early 1950s, suburbs began blanketing the American landscape and the exodus from the cities was on. Many neighborhood soda fountains were forced to close up shop. Ray was losing customers by the dozen, but one small restaurant in San Bernardino, California, kept ordering more machines. Croc had to see for himself the type of place that needed to churn out up to 40 milkshakes at a time. In 1954, he flew to California and met the two brothers who would change his life, Dick and Mac McDonald. In the late 1920s, while Ray Croc was selling paper cups around Chicago, Two brothers from New Hampshire were heading out west to California. Richard and Maurice McDonald Mack, as friends and family called them, were off to seek their fortune. I said, I've decided I'm going to be a millionaire, I says, when I'm 50. So, geez, my brother looked at me, you know, no kidding, he says, how much have you got right now? I says, about eight bucks and a half. <laughs> he says, Richard, you've got a little way to go, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> the two brothers spent a few years pushing sets around a Hollywood movie studio before opening their own theater in the early 1930s. But it soon became clear that showing movies was not going to fulfill Dick's lofty financial goals. Eventually, the brothers noticed that the hot dog stand on the corner of their street seemed to be the only thriving business in the area. In 1937, they took a cue from their successful neighbor and opened their own small hot dog stand a few towns away. Three years later, they moved to San Bernardino, California, and opened a larger drive-in restaurant, complete with car hops, called McDonald's. Like most other drive-ins that were popping up on the West Coast, it was an immediate success. Californians delighted in getting full menu service without ever leaving their beloved automobiles. For eight years, Dick and Mac ran the most successful drive-in in town. But in the late 1940s, the McDonald brothers sensed a change in their customers. After World War II, Americans began to look at the world in a whole new way. After the war, there was this sense that we worked hard, we fought, we won this war. Now the good life is ours. It is owed to us. And by definition, that good life involves speed of all kinds, speed in fast cars with tail fins that look like they could fly, and speed in terms of getting what you want when you wanted it. You know, we were kind of getting into an age of jet propulsion, and this was really a horse and buggy operation. So uh, 
We knew we had to do something to speed things up. The McDonald's closed their successful drive-in and set out to reinvent the restaurant business. What they created was a kitchen that operated with the efficiency of a Henry Ford assembly line. They cut their menu from 25 items down to nine. Hamburgers, cheeseburgers, milkshakes, french fries, and drinks. They sped up service by designing new equipment like bigger grills and condiment dispensers that allowed them to prepare each and every burger the very same way. Most importantly, they changed over from car hop service to self-service. When people found out what we were going to do, they thought we had gone insane. Because we had a great business. We had the most popular drive-in in town. And uh, people couldn't understand. They said, my God, the McDonald's brothers, I think that they're, <laughs> they're losing their minds. But they weren't losing their minds. They were simply pioneering the greatest revolution in American restaurant history, fast food. The McDonald brothers cut serving time down from 20 minutes to 30 seconds. To do that, they broke almost every rule in the business. I mean, the point of going out to a restaurant was you could have steak, you could have shrimp, you could have fish, you could have chicken. The idea of going to a place that had a hamburger, and if you don't like that, you could have a hamburger, and if you don't like that, you could have a hamburger. You know, it, in a way, it defies logic, but, but that's sometimes what great genius is. It defies logic. The McDonald's genius revealed itself at the cash register. Sales shot up 40% in three years. In 1952, their small hamburger stand in San Bernardino made the cover of American Restaurant Magazine. Pretty soon, everyone wanted to know how they did it. Over the next few years, people in the food industry came from all over the country to check out the McDonald Brothers operation. One visitor had been preparing his whole life for just such an opportunity, Ray Kroc. He saw the reaction of the public. Uh, he had to see young families there. It wasn't a teenage place. Drive-ins then were teenage places, kind of hangouts. None of that, and uh, so I, th I, I, I wasn't there, but I'm confident that the, the potential on the consumer side, uh, he saw it, bingo, he saw it. Kroc was 52 years old. He had seen thousands of restaurants before, but nothing like this. He calculated the financial rewards possible with hundreds of McDonald's across the country, each of them equipped with eight multi-mixers, but when he discussed the idea with Dick and Mac, they told him they weren't interested in doing it themselves. Well, I said, why don't you get somebody to do it? They said, well, we don't know anybody who want to do it. I said, well, how about me? They said, do you want to bother with it? I said, sure. <laughs> and I thought, oh boy, what a cozy way to sell Mulder mixes. Kroc signed a contract that gave him the exclusive right to sell the McDonald Brothers method. But when he returned to suburban Chicago to open his first McDonald's, he was in for a surprise. The McDonald Brothers neglected to tell him that they had previously licensed this part of Illinois to another company. Before Ray could start doing business, he had to buy out the competing contract for $25,000. Already deeply in debt from building his restaurant, Kroc could barely afford this expense. It was the first of many problems between Ray and the brothers McDonald. <laughs> 